He, of course, is one of the most popular uh, talk show hosts uh, out in California. And I'm, I'm thinking sometimes he's been syndicated. Again, I, I don't have time to follow a lot of media uh, outside of what we do and what the establishment throws at us. Uh, but he's hosted Larry Elder's show for more than 15 years. That's right, nationally syndicated. And I just know every time I see clips of him, uh, it's always just extremely informative. And he's been on everything from Oprah to uh, you name it, LarryElder.com. And I'm very, very excited uh, to have him on the broadcast with us to talk about the state of the world and how crazy uh, everything's gotten and what he expects the collectivists to do. I see him trying to play us off against each other as much as they can desperately so that we don't get together and unify around the Bill of Rights and Constitution. Larry, it's good to have you on with us. Thanks for spending time. Alex, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Oh, it's an honor to have you. Wow, so, uh, 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 so, much, so much is going on. Uh, out there in the world. What is front and center on your radar screen? Well, Alex, as I was trying to tell uh, Mr. Pierce Morgan when I was on there a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, if you really want to talk about gun violence in America, the face of gun violence, as horrific as Sandy Hook was, is not the face of some suburban kid. Uh, a kid is more likely to be struck by lightning, Alex, than to be killed in a school shooting. The face of gun violence uh, in this country is a 15-year-old girl who performed at Obama's inauguration who was killed by one of those to whom it made concerned gang-related bullets. It's a six-year-old Latina girl who was sitting on her porch one uh, night in March last year, Alex, one of five people to be killed in that hour in Chicago. Chicago is a city right now which is on track for two Sandy Hooks per month. And if you look at the demographics of Chicago, the city is roughly a third black, a third white, and a third Hispanic. However, the homicides, 70% of them are committed by black people, and usually the victim is almost always another black person. Take New York. New York, demographically, about 46% or so white, about 17 to 20% uh, Hispanic, about that same number of blacks. However, according to Police Commissioner Kelly, 96% of the homicides are committed by black and brown people. Almost always, Alex, the victim is another black or brown person. Now, the question is, why is this going on? We have a couple of possible uh, suspects. One is racism. Problem with that is during Jim Crow, when we had not only de facto segregation, but we had legal uh, segregation, you didn't find this kind of criminality coming from the black community. What about racism? During, uh, uh, during the Great Depression, 50% of the black adults were unemployed. 50%. You did not find this kind of criminality. 70% today of black kids are born outside of wedlock. That has tripled the number back in 1965. Today, 50% of Hispanic kids are born outside of wedlock, about 35% of white kids. Now, I mention that because there's a direct relationship between not having a father in the house and fill in the blank of your favorite social ill, whether it's dropouts, whether it's uh, unemployment, whether it's, yes, gun homicide, a direct relationship between not having a father in the house and bad behavior. And we've incentivized people into having children without getting married because we've given people money after the so-called war on poverty was launched. Lyndon Johnson, Alex, literally sent poverty workers going door to door uh, in inner city households, letting women know of their so-called rights to welfare, provided there was no man in the house. So from 1965, the percentage of black kids born outside of wedlock has tripled as we spent $16 trillion on so-called poverty programs. We've incentivized people into making bad decisions. We've allowed women to get food stamps, AFDC, you name it. A woman with two children living on welfare is making more money than she would if he had a, had a minimum wage job. And we've allowed the man to abandon his financial and moral responsibility. Bill Cosby calls such men unwed fathers. That's what we've done for the last 50 years, and the left can't come to the conclusion, oh my lord, what have I done? So they got to blame racism, sexism, and yes, high-capacity magazines. Well, absolutely. I saw you with one of our reporters do an interview a few weeks ago, David Ortiz, and that's why I wanted Ortiz wanted to get you on to expand on all of this because it's so crazy that now you say, I don't want socialist health care, racist. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want, uh, you know, to have uh, all of this uh, corporate welfare, racist. Uh, I want my Second Amendment. And then the Fox columnist and others say, well, that's racist. And I go, explain to me how it's racist. And they go, I'm not going to. I'm going to throw that out to distract the whole debate. And then I go back to Margaret Sanger, who said, look at these black communities. They're becoming wealthy. They're self-sufficient. We're not going to integrate to bring real equality. We're going to integrate so we can get rid of these weeds. Mm -hmm. We've got to pose as liberals. Are you familiar? I mean, you're, you're pretty smart and, and, and obviously informed guy, but most people aren't that I talk to of her writings and stuff. And that I don't think, oh, sure. I don't think the left actually did this on accident. A lot of bleeding hearts actually think it's good and actually want to help people. But the higher ups, I mean, the Democratic Party was the Ku Klux Klan party, but when they couldn't suppress blacks anymore of the 20s and 30s, they became the Democrats. 
the Democratic Party has been completely skanky. Uh, the members of the Democratic Party formed the Klan. The Klan used to be called the terror wing of the Democratic Party. And you're right about Margaret Sanger. She was a proponent of eugenics. She believed that certain people were socially undesirable, and they were usually poor, uh, young black women. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I've written a book about this called Dear Father, Dear Son, Two Lives, Eight Hours, where I talk about the importance of fathers. And one of the things I try and do, Alex, is, is use sources that people can't impeach. Uh, you know, I could use the Heritage Foundation. They've done all sorts of studies showing the lack of fathers and all the social ills that I mentioned. Charles Murray wrote a wonderful book called Losing Ground, arguably the most important book about the devastation to the nuclear intact family by the welfare state that's been written in the last 50 years. So I use people like that well-known neocon Tupac Shakur. After he died, Alex, of the documentary that came out called Resurrection. And in the documentary, he said, I know for a fact if I had had a father in my life, I would have had some discipline and I would have been more confident. A man needs to be raised by a man. And then he proceeded to explain why he joined gangs. He wanted protection, he wanted structure, and he wanted values. He's, he's saying this. I'm not saying this. This is Tupac Shakur. And the LA Times had a poll back in the 80s. And they asked poor people and non-poor people the following question. Do you believe that young poor women often have children to get additional welfare benefits? The majority of non-poor people said no. However, when poor people were asked the same question, do you believe that young poor women often have children to get additional benefits? 64% said yes. So they're telling us we're just not listening. And one time I had on my show one of these so-called black leaders, Kwesi Mfume. I haven't been able to get Jackson or Farrakhan or Sharpton on my show in 20 years. But Kwesi Mfume, when he was then the head of the NAACP, came on. And to his credit, I asked him the following question. Mr. Mfume, as between the presence of white racism, which you often talk about, or the absence of black fathers, which in my opinion you don't talk about enough, which poses the bigger threat to the black community? And without missing a beat, he said, the absence of fathers. So they're telling us we're just not listening. You're right. And, and then they'll say we need fathers, but do everything to destroy them and then promote and embrace the most destructive, uh, fake, you know, gangster culture stuff. Uh, and again, the young boys don't have a father. So then they see MTV and the tough guys that are the male role models, you know, are these right. gangster drug dealers. I, I mean, look, this has been done on purpose. I mean, there's no way. And I've got the documents and evidence. I've gone over it. I, I covered my film Endgame. And, and uh, yeah. I've actually read quite a few of the blurbs and articles where people have picked up some of your writings. I need to read your books. I need to, to carry them in our bookstore. Tell us some about your books because this is something that can be used, uh, you know, the knowledge you're laying out to empower people. And I think I'm going to read them. Other people should as well. Well, uh, Alex, my book, Dear Father, Dear Son, is about my relationship with my own father, which was not good. My father was a, what I call a, a, a junkyard dog dad. He was a Monfort Point Marine. They were the equivalent of the Tuskegee Airmen. He was the first black Marine. There were 20,000 of them that trained uh, in North Carolina. So rough, tough guy. And I uh, misunderstood his tough exterior for lack of love. He beat us with a belt, uh, with a telephone cord. Not uncommon uh, the way people were punished in those days, especially if the, if the adult came from the South. But I just mistook that for lack of love. So when I'm 15 years old, my dad and I have this furious fight. And we don't speak for 10 years. And finally, I'm 25 years old. We sit down and we speak. I figured the conversation would last 10 minutes. It lasted eight hours. And during that period of time, I found out that the name Elder, my last name, is the name of the boyfriend who was in his life the longest. He never married his mother. He was an alcoholic who beat my father and his mother. My dad comes home from school, has a fight with the mother's then boyfriend, a different man than Elder. The mother sides with the boyfriend. My dad is thrown out of the house, never to return. We're talking about a black kid, Jim Crow South, age of 13, a year or two before the beginning of the Great Depression, Athens, Georgia. And my dad never returned home. And despite all of his troubles, my dad always told my brothers and me this. Hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. No matter how hard you work, bad things are going to happen. And how you respond to those bad things will tell me whether or not your mother and I raised a man. And I would always say, not too much pressure, Dad. My point is this. He was around. He was a rough, tough, imperfect father, but he was around. And by word and by deed, exactly. he taught me what it's like to be a dad. Well, they say a dad's got to be perfect. And, and you know what? Your dad gets scared. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. You're not listening. You're out of control. I'll tell you, it's better to have brutal discipline than no discipline at all. These kids are a wreck. So they end up in prison. They end up dead. And it's because they've destroyed fathers in America that now what happened to the black community has been done everywhere else. And it is destroying our civilization. And Alex, the key is hard work. The formula is very simple. Graduate from high school, don't have a kid before you're 20 years old, and get married before you have the kid. James Q. Wilson said anybody who follows that formula will not be poor. If you, if you fail to follow that formula, there's a good chance.
chance you are going to be poor. So the question is, what are we doing to incentivize, or perhaps more importantly, what are we doing to de-incentivize people into following that formula? That's what's going on here. And we know what works, Alex, because in 1996, Bill Clinton reluctantly signed the Welfare Reform Act. What happened? Welfare rolls declined by over 50 percent. So we know that a bunch of able-bodied and able-minded people were on the couch. They got off after they realized the jig was up. We need to continue that, and welfare needs to be done at the state and local level. The federal government needs to get out of it all together, and we need to encourage the so-called thousand points of life. There are a whole bunch of people in the community doing stuff, big brothers, big sisters. I belong to an organization called A Place Called Home, where uh, I contribute money to an organization that teaches people on computers and and that's what you have to do in the short run because there aren't fathers here. You have to incentivize people to get into their communities and to be mentors for these young people until we turn out the culture, which is changing policies and letting people know it is not a good idea to be an unwed father. That's an expression that Bill Cosby uh, has been using. My mother and my dad has been using. Oh, yeah. People think it's so cool to go get young women pregnant and, 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 and then just turn your kids loose to be destroyed. There is nothing more punkish than that. And, you know, when I mentioned Kowese and Fume, this is the guy who turned his life around, Alex. This is the guy who had four or five kids by four or five different women and then turned his life around and has been dedicating himself to trying to improve things in the black community. The thing that really bothers me about some of these so-called black leaders, whether it's Farrakhan, Jackson, or... Um or Sharpton, they all should know something about the importance of fathers because in their own lives, their fathers were either absent or bad dads. Jackson's father was a married man who lived next door to his teenage mother, got her pregnant. Jackson grew up in South Carolina with taunts. Jesse ain't got no daddy. Jesse ain't got no daddy. It bothered him. In the case of Sharpton, Sharpton was middle class until his father abandoned the family, then down to the ghetto. In the case of Farrakhan, his mother was estranged from her husband, had a boyfriend, took back up with the, with the estranged husband, got pregnant, didn't want the boy friend to know so she, so she tried to abort Farrakhan with a coat hanger, hanger on several occasions so all well that's right when you cheat on your wife you. when you cheat on your wife folks you're really cheating on your kids mm. I, mean, I mean that's the bottom line people think it's so cool to cheat they think it's really sexy really fun I'm not judging people that have done it we're human stuff goes but the point is it's certainly not something to be proud of the the one of the greatest expressions I've ever heard about this Alex is the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother because when these kids get into the streets, Alex, with no father, they're thin-skinned, they're angry, they resent adults. They have no idea on how to resolve disputes in an intelligent way without profanity and without violence. That's one of the many things you see when you have an adult relationship in your house with your mother and your father. You're watching adults resolve disputes. You're watching a guy get up and go to work when he doesn't feel like it. That's what you don't see. Hard work wins. And we're discouraging that with our welfare state uh, and by incentivizing people into making bad moral decisions. Now, it was, uh, who was the football coach that said, uh, winners never quit and quitters never win? Sounds like something uh, Lombardi would say. Th that's who said it, yeah. Mm -hmm. you... It's so true, though. I mean, I, I go down to demonstrations and things, and they'll have communists and socialists down there, and I'll walk up, and they'll go, oh, look, it's a capitalist. And I look at them, and I'm like, look, I mean, I, you really think communism is better than, than what f f uh, free market and freedom creates, I said, look at what communism does. They just laugh. I mean, they really think that when they collapse America into communism, they're going to have some great time. I mean, they're just idiots. They're just idiots. Uh, they're just morons. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing. Well, you know, in 1900, at all three levels, Alex, government took about 7% of the nation's income. Right now, when you put a monetary value on so-called unfunded mandates, we're talking about federal, state, and local taking over 40% of the people's income. One of the reasons America has been so great is that we trusted uh, our people with our own money and with our own time. We no longer do that. We've got a president uh, who's now added a fourth leg to our welfare state. We've got Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and now Obamacare. Until and unless we reverse that, we're going to still underproduce. Two percent sucks as GDP. We should be rocking and rolling at four and four and five percent. We should be creating three and four and five hundred thousand jobs per month the way we did at this juncture during the Ronald Reagan recovery. This is the worst recovery since the Great Depression. It's because of these policies. Well, it's not a recovery. I mean, that's even a hoax. Well, even, yeah, you're right. That last quarter we had negative growth, although they had revised it upwards a little bit. Uh, this is just awful. And, and you look at the percentage of people, able-bodied people, who've just given up the labor force participation rate is what we ought to be looking at. Well, I think a lot of, I know a lot of hardworking people that are giving up because they're sick of watching lazy people sit around and live off them. But then that's what happens in any social society. Finally, the people working three jobs give up, and, man, then things really get bad. Well, that's what Mitt Romney was talking about with the 47%. People weren't listening. 
once you get to a point where over 50 percent of the voters are not paying federal income taxes, they can march in there and pull the lever for a raise on somebody else's dime. We are in deep, deep. Well, yeah, they spun it that he didn't care about the other percent. No, he was saying they're not listening to me. They're on the government payroll. They don't care. They don't care. Well, you mentioned how they spin it, and that really is a deeper problem. When everybody talks to me about the postmortem, what Mitt Romney could have done and could have done this, could have done that, there's plenty of things he could have done and could have said that might have made, made him win. But you have to go to the main, what I call the mainstream media. Alex, all these people, ABC, NBC, CBS, I call it MSNB Hee Haw, virtually every... No, no, they, they all distort everything. Stay yeah. there. Wow, this is amazing. I'm Darren McBreen, and these are some of the new items that are available now at InfoWarsShop.com. Alert the public to Obama's blatant abuse of power with the new Obama t-shirt. Obama's joker face on the front and come and take it on the back. It's time to publicly call him out for what he is, a tyrant. Defend the Second Amendment with our top seller come and take it t-shirts. And look at that, women's cut tank tops and t-shirts now available. Nice hat. Plus, the Don't Tread on Me flag. And now you can become a micro distributor of the InfoWars magazine. Plus, get your own copy delivered right to your door each and every month. And if you're tired like I am of you and your family being exposed to polluted drinking water, get the Pro One High Performance Water Filter. It gets rid of all pathogenic bacteria, cysts, fluoride, heavy metals, and numerous other contaminants. So join the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. Uh, Larry Elder, uh, you know, I've heard him on the radio many times and had a chance to read some of the articles that are out there that he's put out. And it's just spot on with the problems that our society uh, is facing. It's just the collectivist, I go back to this, I've read their writings, they did this on purpose. They want to dominate us. They want to control us. They want us dependent. And I think we should not call liberals liberals. I, I, I really think whenever I talk to prominent libertarian conservatives like Mr. Elder, I say, look, can, can we please stop calling them liberals? Because Thomas Jefferson was a liberal. These people are not liberals. They're authoritarian, social engineering, eugenicist-based monsters at the top. Their writings are public. They think we're idiots. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I think it's despicable how they are trying to invoke racial division at a level that's cartoonish. Uh, Larry, I, I mean, am I wrong in saying that we shouldn't call them liberals and that the race baiting? I mean, it's obvious who the, not even racists are. They're, they're, just, they're just trying to divide people like social engineers coldly. I mean, you turn on MSNBC, it is absurdist. It's so over the top that if you don't agree to everything they want, you're a racist with, with no reason why you're a racist. Well, they're the ones who are the biggest. The other day on my show, I, I was called out because uh, there's an LAPD officer, black officer, who's suing the LAPD, claiming that he's a victim of racial discrimination. And you look at his complaint, uh, Alex, it's a bunch of, you know, like station house pranks. Somebody put some fried chicken on a cake on his 20th uh, anniversary in the forest. Somebody put a little mock caption on a, on a picture of him with Stanford and Son. You know, BFD, this is the kind of stuff that cops do for crying out loud. It's nothing more than a shakedown. This guy calls up, he's very angry at me, describes himself as white, and says, how dare you? You never seem to acknowledge racism, blah, blah, et cetera. I said, you, you're the one who's a bigot, sir. Here I am simply outlining my case, and you're angry at me because a black person is, quote, fighting with the wrong guy. What does that even mean? These guys are the ones who play the race card. Donna Brazil is the one who referred to the Republican Party uh, as having a white boy attitude. She said this when she was the, uh, the campaign manager for Al Gore. Out here in L.A., there's a, a, a state senator named Diane Watson, who later on ran and became a U.S. congresswoman during the, a fight to get rid of race-based preferences in California. Uh, the guy who led the fight was a black man named Ward Connerly. So Diane Watson, a, a, a black woman, comes out and attacks him and says, let me tell you why you're supporting getting rid of, of, of race-based preferences. You are married to a white woman. You don't want to be black. You are, um, you're not proud of yourself as a black man. That's why you support this. Can you imagine anybody Republican saying that to anybody? And then two days later when a reporter confronted her, she said, that's right, I said it, and I don't take it back. And she ran for Congress and got elected. I can give you example after example after example of where people on the left make the most hideous uh, charges. Charlie Rangel said of Republican Congress after 1994 when they took it over, he said they don't say S-word anymore, a slur for Hispanics. They don't say N-word anymore, the slur for, for, uh, for blacks. He used the actual slur. They don't say S or N-word anymore. They just say let's cut taxes. So cutting taxes.
taxes is racist. Charlie Rangel also said George W. Bush was our Bull Connor. For people under 20 years old, Bull Connor was that southern sheriff who stick water hoses and dogs on civil rights workers uh, when, when they were marching with Martin Luther King. Are you ki kidding me? George Bush is our Bull Connor? And furthermore, Charlie Rangel added, and if that doesn't make you angry, I don't know what will, end of quote. Unintentionally well, now Charlie Rangel, who's been on the show before, said we must overcome white Southerners, and so did Sharpton, something similar, to get the guns, like having guns is only for white people. You know, Martin Luther King said be colorblind, which I agree with, and then the opposite, they're always about the color instead of the character of the deeds and, and what the person stands for. And but for the Second Amendment, a whole lot of these civil rights workers and people that were defending themselves would be dead. You know what, let's do a look. Uh, can you do like five more minutes to, to actually expand on that? Sure, I can. Jakari Jackson here, and I want to talk to you for a second about water. You know about ProPure, our flagship water purification system, but check out some of our portable water filter products at InfoWarsStore.com, the clearly filtered water pitcher. Also, for those of you on the go, we have the Athlete Edition filtered water bottle and the RAD Eliminator Pro Filtered Sports Bottle that removes radiation. And keep in mind, we have replacement filters for all of these products. The ever-popular grab-and-go-back favorite, the Life Straw. The Crystal Quest Shower Filter System. And the Aquapod Kit, great for mass storage of water. And while you're at the InfoWars shop, pick up a copy of our latest book, 31 Days to Survival. You can find all this and more at the InfoWarsStore.com. And don't forget, it's your support that funds our operation. Sign up for our free newsletter at InfoWars.com forward slash newsletter. You know, on the issue of corporal punishment, I think it's very important. And in the, in the few times I did things that were really bad, like take money out of my mom's purse or something because I wanted a cap gun or something. You know, my dad gave me a really good whooping. We got in trouble with the football coaches when we were bad and or gotten you know trouble. They give us a bunch of pops. You notice they've taken all that out, and now people just shoot each other. Uh, but I'm 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 already segueing off because I wanted to with with Larry Elder, the big uh, nationally syndicated uh, libertarian talk show host and, and the, uh, conservative commentator and best-selling author as well. And he, he's all of everything from. Um, from CNN to Fox News to uh, you name it, but we only have a few minutes left. But you were, you know, getting into your dad, and I understand going too far, or, you know, really coming from the hard streets, and then still trying to be a dad. And your kids aren't doing what you're saying. It's just nowadays they act like if you just spank your child, it's criminal when it's not, and and it, it's much meaner to not teach someone that hey, there's consequences to something if you're not going to listen to me, and if grounding you isn't enough, I won't apologize for corporal punishment. I don't have to do it very much, but they know it's there, and and, and my wife won't spank my kids. And so sometimes they don't do what she says or she doesn't do it very often. They know I will. And just from that, they won't do stuff like walk out in the street. So I'm not, but that, that's a side issue. I just wanted to see if you had anything else to say about corporal punishment. Well, all I know is if my dad had died with, with his, his estate having money and if the statute of limitations hadn't expired, Alex, I could sue the SOB for excessive punishment based on the way people are right now. Yeah. Are you kidding me? People used a belt in those days. People used a telephone cord. They used whatever they could, whatever was nearby. But they did it out of love, as imperfectly as we see that right now. They just did it out of love. And, Alex, my dad worked two full-time jobs as a janitor. He cooked for a family on the weekend, went to night school three nights a week to get his GED because, as I mentioned, he was thrown out of the house by his mom when he was 13 years old. So the guy, the guy averaged maybe four hours of sleep a night for decades. So you add that plus his, his background, and, okay, he wasn't Ward Cleaver. Cleaver. He wasn't Ward. But it's true. The media acts like if you even yell at your kid, it's abuse. That's because they don't want the parent in control. They're going to put them on Ritalin and Prozac, you know, to make them behave, which is assaulting their brain viciously. The truth is dads get mad when they've got to spank their child because you hate it so much. You get even madder, uh, even though you don't show it, that, that, that you've got to do this to make them behave. And as I mentioned, it is important for us to learn morals and values. In my book, Dear Father, Dear Son, I talk about, uh, with my dad, a prison chaplain of a federal prison who wanted to improve the morale of the prison. So he went to one of these major greeting card companies and got 500 greeting cards for Mother's Day. Took them back to the prison, and sure enough, the men filled them out, sent them off to good old mom, and, and the morale in the prison improved. So he thought he would do the same thing for Father's Day. And you know where I'm going with this story. He Caused a riot. A greeting card company gets 500 greeting cards, company, greeting cards for Father's Day. Not one inmate, Alex, not one wanted to send it out and send it to dad. Now, what does it tell you? That you're four times more likely to end up in prison if you don't have a dad at home. That's right. The people who are 
behind bars, three out of four of them had either no relationship or a bad relationship with their father. It's incredible. We only got a minute left, but the whole issue, it's on record that the Second Amendment's what allowed the civil rights movement to happen. The first gun laws were by the Klan in the South to, to not let newly freed uh, black Americans have their guns. And people don't realize that the Klan, as I mentioned, would used to be called the terror wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, and as far as the civil rights movement is concerned, Democrats voted unanimously against the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that freed uh, blacks, that made them uh, citizens right away, and that these on paper gave them the right to vote. Uh, Democrats voted against that stuff unanimously. If you look at the Civil Rights Act of 1964, as a percentage of the party, more Republicans voted for it than did Democrats. So it puts the lie to this so-called Southern strategy as being racist. What sense does it make to join a party where, as a percentage, more of that party voted for the Civil Rights Act of 64 than the party you left if you're leaving because of racial reasons? It makes no sense. Yeah, it's not known that Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act more than the Democrats. I know it's just a total fraud. It just shows, and not that Republicans have obviously got their big issues, too, but, I mean, the Democratic Party is just such a snake-like organization that they're just they're just so over the top larry elder thank you that was an amazing interview thank you for your time sir next time you're on i'll be more prepared to really get into things with you sir anytime alex anytime all right we'll talk to you again soon there goes larry elder let's get him on in a month or so to take calls uh we're going to be uh going into retransmission now great job of the crew have a great safe weekend i'll see you back sunday four to six central visit infowars.com and prisonplanet.com when you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want.